I'm going to explain when insurance companies act in bad faith. When an insurance company issues an insurance policy to an individual or a company, it's actually a contract. A contract is a negotiated agreement between two parties. Uh, it doesn't have to be reduced to writing, but insurance policies are always reduced to writing. Just because it's reduced to writing, it doesn't mean it's restricted to the writings of that policy. Because the law infers in every contract that the parties to a contract will act in good faith. When parties to a contract in the execution of that contract do not act in good faith, they are acting in bad faith. Well, when a party to a contract acts in bad faith, they have liability for the consequences that flow from that bad faith activity. And that holds true for insurance companies. Inferred in every insurance policy is that the insurance company will act in good faith. Well, what does act in good faith mean? From the insured's perspective, the person who's being protected by the insurance policy, acting in good faith means that the insurance policy will not expose the individual or the company to personal liability over and above the insurance amount. If they do, if the insurance company exposes the insured to liability over and above the insurance amount when they did not have a good faith basis to do so, then they may be acting in bad faith. So how does that happen? If somebody, and I'll give the, uh, a broad strokes hypothetical and then I'll tell you a real scenario, but if, for example, an individual is driving down the road and uh, hits a pedestrian who's in the crosswalk and the individual was texting at the time and it's 100% their fault and the individual who was in the crosswalk is catastrophically injured or even dies, has a traumatic brain injury, is, loses a limb, some very catastrophic injury, and the in individual in the car only has $100,000 of insurance. If the lawyer for the catastrophic injured person writes to the insurance company and says, the damages, the injuries that are caused far exceed the available insurance coverage, but we are willing to accept the $100,000 in full satisfaction for any and all claims and not go against your insured personally. If the insurance company doesn't immediately offer and pay that $100,000, I'd ask why not? Very simply, the insurance company is making a decision not in the best interest of their insured. They are not acting in good faith, but rather they're making a decision that puts their interest, the insurance company's interest, above their insured's interest, which is contrary to what the insurance policy requires, and in turn, acting in bad faith. Now, if the insurance company offered 90,000 out of the 100,000, that is an act of acting in bad faith. The lawyer for the injured person does not need to accept it, and here uh, I'll extend the hypothetical. They don't accept it. They pursue a jury trial, a, a jury awards, hypothetically, a million dollars. Now the individual insured owes 900000 to the person they've catastrophically injured, but they never would have owed that if the insurance company acted in good faith. So the insured, the individual who paid the premiums to the, insurance pol to the insurance company and who caused the catastrophic injury, now has their own claim against the insurance company saying, you represented me in bad faith, exposed me to $900,000 excess verdict, and which you need to pay. So what often happens is that insured is going to bring that lawsuit for the benefit of the injured person. So what can happen is that insured, the person who was once a defendant, 
can assign their rights or their claim against their own insurance company to the injured person's lawyer to pursue that uh, additional $900,000 for the benefit of the injured person. That is the short version of what a bad faith claim is, where the insurance company acts in bad faith. They put their interests ahead of their insureds. Now, the scenario I just outlined for you related to liability insurance. When the liability insurance company has an obligation to protect their own insured from a personal judgment. Now, how about when uh, an insurance company does that but against their own insured? That they had under insurance which I've outlined for you, and if you're not clear on what under insurance, I encourage you to, to search for uh, the video blog that outlines under insurance. It's very important information. But if an insurance company doesn't pay the full amount of insurance that's owed their own insured, then they have responsibility and liability for acting in bad faith because there's a presumption in the contract of insurance companies paying that which they're supposed to pay. So uh, there's one scenario, uh, I've handled multiple bad faith cases, uh, but I'd like to share this one because it's, it's little insightful as to how devious insurance companies uh, often are. Uh, and they need to be uh, watched every step of the way. Uh, I represented an individual who uh, was fortunate enough to have $300,000 of underinsurance. He was hit by an individual that only had uh, $50,000 of insurance. So we were able to collect the $50,000 of insurance and then seek the difference of what his injuries were from his own insurance company. And uh, the process that we had to go through was an arbitration and an arbitrator awarded $250,000 to my client. So I wrote to the insurance company and said, the, here's the arbitrator's award, you owe $250,000. And they said, no, 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 you, we get a credit for what you've already received, the $50,000. Well, whether they get a credit or not is fully defined by the insurance policy, the contract of insurance that's between the individual and the insurance company. There are some states that predefine that as a matter of law, and there's a statute that says they either do get a credit or they don't get a credit. And if there's no state law that defines whether they receive a credit, the insurance company receives a credit for what the injured person has already received, then it's limited to what's contained in the contract. And the state where I represented this individual was defined as to what's in the contract. So I said to the insurance company, there's no dispute that you owe your own insured, my client, $200,000. And really all we're fighting over is whether or not you owe the other $50,000 that they've collected from the insured or do you get a credit for it. So why don't you pay the $200,000 now, we'll submit it to a judge and the judge will tell us if you owe the other 50,000. If the judge says you owe the 50,000, you pay it. If the judge says you don't owe the 50,000, we'll honor it. They said no. Okay. So the process that we have to go through is we take the arbitrator's award and it's called convert it to a judgment. So we took the arbitrator's award and we converted it to a judgment and we served the judgment on the insurance company. The insurance company said, we only pay you uh, 200,000. That then makes it ripe to go to a judge. And we presented the judgment to a judge and said, Your Honor, uh, we'd like you to uh, acknowledge that it's 250000 And they argued it was 200000 The judge heard everything, read the insurance policy, and said, 250000 you get no credit. So I wrote to the insurance company and said, pay the $250,000. They said, no. 
we're appealing it. We think the judge got it wrong. He said, well, pay the 200000 You know you at least owe that. No, we're not paying anything. Okay. They go to the appellate court. This now takes another 18 months. But once you enter a judgment, you're entered and entitled to interest. In this particular state, you're entitled to 9% interest from the date of the judgment. So now, while they're not going to pay the 250000 I assured my client, that's okay. You're getting 9% interest no matter how long this will take. You're getting it on the 200000 and it should be the 250000 So what does the insurance company do? They now send in a check for $250,000, but what they, I'm sorry, for, they send in a check for $200,000. And on the back of the check, they write full and complete satisfaction for any and all claims. Now, if you're not a lawyer, you may not understand that if you actually sign that and deposit, the, deposit that check, that's a contract. And you are uh, giving up your rights to pursue going forward. So I took that check and sent it back to the insurance company and said, no, 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 you owe $250,000. 3 months later, they send another check in for $200,000, says full and complete satisfaction. And I'm sure that they were hoping that a support staff member in my firm, maybe somebody in the accounting department, would just take the check and deposit it without looking at it. And of course, we look at everything, and they bring it to my attention, and I send it back. This is all while the appeal is going on. Three months later, they send another check, 200000 full and complete satisfaction. We send it back, but this time I got a little nastier. And I said, no, 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 don't ever send another check unless you're going to send the $250,000 with the interest that you owe. The checks stopped coming. The appellate court agreed with the trial judge, said they owe the full $250,000. said, okay, now insurance company pay the $250,000 plus all the interest that you owe. And they said, no, we're not paying anything because we're going to appeal the appellate court because at the highest court, there's a third layer of appeal. It was insane to even think that that highest level of appellate court would take it because they only accept cases on appeal if there's a constitutional issue or there's a, a difference in the law in multiple jurisdictions within the state of which there was not. I can't stop the insurance company from, from dragging that out. They have a right to try to get to do that appeal, but we knew they were going to go nowhere. So we're waiting and we're waiting, and now a full another 15 months go by. And, and what I'm sharing with you, I hate to date myself, predates the internet. It's when we used to get the actual law, law a journal and read the newspaper and that the way you discovered whether or not the highest court accepted the appeal you physically got the newspaper and you would read through the newspaper and you they didn't tell you when it was it was just in the newspaper so after 15 months not hearing a word all of a sudden we get in the mail a check for two hundred thousand dollars and on the back it says full and complete satisfaction said, these bastards, what are they doing? And I send it back, and I get the newspaper. Sure enough, the day before, the appellate court ruled that they are not going to hear the appeal, and they have nowhere else to go. So they took one last shot to slip the check in. So this is what I did. Once you have a judgment as an attorney, I have the option to execute that judgment. What does that mean? That means I can take that judgment that's signed by a judge. They just sent me a check. What does a check tell you? It tells you the bank, where they bank, and the bank account number. I take the judgment and I serve the judgment on what is called an information subpoena on the bank. And it freezes the bank account of the insurance company. The insurance company goes crazy. I told my secretary the next day, I said, you're going to hear and get a lot of phone calls tomorrow. Here's the deal. I'm not available. I'm not coming in till noon. Because I knew once I froze that insurance company's 
uh, bank account, they can't do anything. Not one thing until I advise the bank that the judgment's been satisfied. So I show up about noon. I have maybe 50 messages from the defense lawyer who I've been doing this battle with uh, throughout this whole process and who didn't have the courtesy of paying the $200,000 to my client. And he gets me on the phone. I call him at about noon. And he says, what'd you do that for? I said, do what? He said, what'd you freeze the insurance company's bank account for? And turns out, I subsequently found out, it wasn't just where they pay claims out of, they also make uh, payroll out of that. And it happened to be payroll week and all the payroll checks bounced. And he was angry with me, what you do that for? And he's yelling at me, you shouldn't have done that. You know that they have the money to pay for it. And I said, very simply, listen, you did what you thought was in the best interest of your client, your insurance company, and I did what I thought was in the best interest of my client. Either you pay the money or it's gonna continue to be frozen. He goes, well, I don't think you should, and I said, I don't give a fuck what you think. You pay the money. He says, well, how much? Well, the 250,000 went up to about 292,000 after you added the 9% interest. I said, unless I have $292,000 on my desk the next day, it's gonna stay frozen. First thing in the morning, 292,000 is on my desk. I think we're done. Deposit it, my client's happy as could be. 10 days later, I got a phone call from my client what did you do? What do you mean, what did I do? The insurance company just served a lawsuit against me, which was 16 paragraphs, claiming that, uh, that he uh, exploited the insurance company for too much insurance. And then within 15 minutes of hanging up the phone with my client, they sued me as well. So they sued my client and they sued me, claiming there was too much insurance, uh, I'm sorry, too much interest being charged. Well, the reality is, I told them 292,000, they really owed 293, 292,000, probably 400. But I always, I always make sure I added up a little bit less. But the guy didn't do his math. All he did was sue me and my client. So rather than just call him up and say, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it, and, and explain it to him, I countersued him. I countersued him, I countersued the insurance company, I told him it was malicious prosecution, you're acting in bad faith, and we had now a whole new lawsuit. Well, what happened was the lawyer for acted out of anger, because I told him off on the phone, uh, and made him pay every penny that he owed my client, uh, he got so angry, he acted emotionally and started a frivolous lawsuit. Well, just because he started a frivolous lawsuit doesn't mean we have to accept the frivolity of that litigation. And we countersued him saying you commence that frivolous lawsuit and acted in bad faith and uh, several other claims. Suffice it to say, his lawsuit was 16 paragraphs against us our countersuit was 124 paragraphs back at him. Well, the insurance company is now on the hook. And the insurance company takes that lawyer off of the case and moves it to another lawyer. As soon as the new lawyer gets on the case, he calls me. First thing he says is, look, you know, uh, I'm really sorry. This, he did that math the wrong way. And I'll tell you what, if you um, withdraw your countersuit, we'll stop our lawsuit. We'll drop the lawsuit that we brought against you. You drop your countersuit. He said, you can do whatever you want. My case is going forward. He said, okay, then we're not going to drop our lawsuit against you. So the next step that happens is we, after going through the processes of a lawsuit, brought a, what's called a motion to dismiss the case against us. And when we brought that motion to dismiss, we said we want sanctions and costs, 
sanctions are very rare for a judge to issue sanctions because really what it is, it requires the lawyer to write a check out of their own pocket and they can't rely on the insurance company. And we said, we want sanctions for bringing a frivolous lawsuit that, w that had no merit whatsoever and dismissed the case. So we went in front of this judge and it would, the first thing that the insurance company did was they, it's called change venue. They moved the venue from where the case originally was to the hometown venue of the insurance company. They thought we would be worried about that. We go and to argue the case for the motion to dismiss and our seeking of sanctions. The judge, the first thing the judge said to me was, look, in the 15 years or 18 years I've been on the bench, I've never sanctioned a lawyer before, ever. So why don't we just try to work this out? And I said, judge, you sit with robes on. You have an obligation to hear the evidence and hear the proof. After you hear everything, if you decide that this action and activity of this insurance company and this insurance company lawyer doesn't require a sanction and you hold them in contempt, I will live by it. But I'm not going to drop it voluntarily until you hear everything. At which time, uh, he conducted a full hearing. I took the stand. I explained the story I just shared with you and I could see the wheels turning in the judge's head. The next witness to testify was the lawyer who sued me and my client. And remember, this is the lawyer who was hired by the insurance company that my client paid premiums to. That lawyer takes the stand and the judge immediately asks him these questions. Can I ask you this? Before you started the lawsuit against Mr. Finkelstein, do you have other lawyers in your office? Yes, I do. Did you get up out of your chair and go to the office next door and say, can you check the math because I'm about to sue a colleague and a lawyer who's doing what he thinks is in the best interest of his client? Can you check to see if they did the math right? Did you do that? And he said, no, I, I didn't do that. I said, okay, but now let me ask you this. After you brought the case to the other lawyer who did the math and determined that the math was done correctly, in fact, saved you $400, did you, in fact, stand, call them and say, we'll drop our lawsuit if you drop yours? He said, yes, I do. Said, That's not how professionals act. When you've done wrong, you apologize and you make things right without conditions. You do not have a quid pro quo asking to drop a meritorious case against you so that you can protect yourself from a frivolous lawsuit that you brought. I sanction you $10,000, at which time he had to pay me $10,000. But that's not the end of the story. Because then he called up and he said, well, I guess this is over. I said, no, 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 that's not over. We still have a claim for the frivolous lawsuit that you brought. All that the judge did was sanction you for doing the actions and activities that you did, but my client suffered harm and I suffered harm. You severed the relationship between uh, myself and my client because my client couldn't understand I, he did everything I recommended he do, do and you sued him. There's damages related to that. Suffice it to say they paid another $30,000 on top and then the whole thing went away. So I tell you that story uh, as a backdrop to insurance companies. They don't always act in the best interest of the people who are paying the premiums to them. But at the end of the day, if you hold tight and you hold strong, they'll make good.